Met two of my neighbor buddies. They were both home on leave from the Marine Corps. They were both in Vietnam, both home on leave together, their brothers. And I got to talk to them and I was kind of excited about what they were doing. And I, since I didn't have a direction as far as what I wanted to major in at college, I thought, well, maybe it'd be a good idea to go enlist in the Marine Corps for a two-year enlistment and get my GI Bill and go back to school. So I did that. I went uh, enlisted in September of 1969, and I went active in uh, actually um, uh, January of 1970. And after the boot camp was done, we went to Pendleton for our individual training with the big guns, uh, bazookas and the machine guns and M16 and so on and so forth. And after that, I got, uh, I was assigned as a field radio operator. MOS was 2531, uh, field radio operator, which is actually a glorified grunt. You carry a radio with you when you're in, in Vietnam. And I went to radio school back at MCR, MCRD in San Diego. We received our, our, uh, our orders for what our MOS military occupational specialty was going to be. And he hollered out Danielson, and, and I responded, and he said, you're 2531, field radio operator. I had no idea what that was at the time. He said, you're the first one to be shot. And that was quite an impression on me. Ultimately, I was assigned to the 1st Marine Division, which turned out to be the 3rd Battalion, 1st Marine, 1st Marine Division. And uh, I was assigned to the h &S Company, which is a support company for uh, the other four line companies, India, Kilo, Lima, and Mike Field company uh, companies so uh, my first station there duty was um, TAD to the India company I did uh, I went in the field with them as a field radio operator I set up the command post and that was the major part of a field radio operator and I would get with each squad and I would go on patrol with them occasionally uh, set up night ambushes and be with the, the line company is pretty regular. We camouflage our radios as best we could. Uh, they call them PRC 77s. We would put them in our pack sack and it looked like it was just personal gear. We had two types of antennas that we used on the radios. Um, one was a whip antenna and one was a tape antenna. A whip antenna extends maybe uh, six, eight feet in the air and it whips back and forth when you're walking. And when you're in a, on a patrol in the grass, and the grass might be up to your waist or higher, and the enemy can see that whip antenna so they know where your radio man is so they'll direct the fire there. So what we did was take a, our tape antenna, and it was only about a, maybe a two foot tape, almost you know very similar to a, a tape that you use to measure. Um, we would screw that in the back of the antenna and we would fold it over and we put it into our shirt so that you couldn't tell it was our antenna. Matter of fact, I turned 21 in Vietnam and Bob Marinucci and some of the other guys were a little bit younger. Because I was 21, they called me Grandpa. And to this day, they still call me Grandpa when I go up there. Maybe half a dozen of the guys, friends that I met through Bob, uh, hey Grandpa, how you doing? You know, so I, that that nickname still stuck with me from from Vietnam, from turning 21. I was the oldest one in my in my platoon. Uh, the field radio operators are, are 25, 31 guys. I was the oldest one, 21. So we were on a resupply mission one day on Long Highway One, which ran north and south through Vietnam. And from our battalion rear area, we had a convoy of approximately six, seven trucks, resupply trucks with uh, uh, men on it and ammunition and water and sea rats and cases of sea rats. And I was driving the Jeep at the time and it's a mobile, a mobile Jeep. Had a radios and along the back of the side of the Jeep. And um, as it was north of Da Nang on High Vaughn Pass area, we got ambushed. Um, there was a mortar ambush, small arms fire, and I was very lucky. During that ambush, one of the enemy mortars landed directly in front of the, my jeep. Uh, 
blew out the windshield of the Jeep, the dash of the Jeep, and uh, the radiator received some damage. And that was probably the closest I'd come to a direct hit in an ambush. And of course, we'd bail out of the Jeep, and one of the trucks went over the edge of the road and exploded. And not a, nobody got hurt on that truck. They jumped out too and were safe. But from that point on, we could see where the enemy was firing at us, and uh, we returned fire. And that incident is where I, I received my. Uh, combat action ribbon. When the battle was over, so to speak, uh, this all happened at night, of course, and that's when the enemy would more often would strike. Um, I, in, my, in the command post on the fire support base, um, I had to help load the body bags under the medevac chopper, and that memory will always be with me, and that was Bad. Well, I came home Christmas Eve day of 1971, December 24th, and I, I can remember in 68, 69, even 1970, a lot of the veterans that were coming home from Vietnam were treated very, very poorly by our, our citizens. Of course, there was a, our nation was divided on the war and the, a lot of the people took it out on the warrior and not our elected officials that sent us to war. We were called, they were called baby killers and they were treated poorly at the airports when they returned from combat from Vietnam. Well, for me, I was able to suppress these memories, the bad stuff, and uh, I went back to school right away. I, within 10 days after being home, I was back a student at Bemidji State and at the time, they had a, a BSC Vets Club on campus. And so there were about 40 of us Vietnam veterans that we went back to school. We formed this club, and it was very similar to a fraternity. Uh, we had fundraisers for the college, and of course, we had parties. And, and being with these other veterans, war combat veterans, uh, that helped ease the transition into civilian life, so to speak. We, we would have meetings, and we would talk about our experiences and how we can help each other get back, get our lives back together and, and stay in school and support each other. And that was very helpful. Later in life, when I became a conservation officer for the state of Minnesota, well, I had some bad incidents, deer hunting, um, where I had to load some young people in a body bag again load them in the ambulance and that was instant flashback. Um, it was bad and uh, I guess I've seen enough of the bad things and having to do that in Vietnam and then do it on civilian life, it was, uh, it's tragic and it's always going to affect you and it's affected me and, and uh, bad is bad. So.